Hi, everybody. How was the parties last night? Uh, it's more woos I would have thought because anybody who's here probably didn't party. <laughs> Think again. But uh, I have a feeling at least one of the people on the panel was because she helped set one up, and that would be Barbara Drescher, who's sitting there typing. What do you? What do you? What do you tell us about your blog post? I don't blog while I'm on the stage. You don't? I'm taking notes about what I'm going to talk about. Are you, make, are you making notes about my fun audience members? Yes. Keep that in mind. <laughs> and next to her is Vandy Beth Glenn, right? Yes. Glenn. And uh, I will let her tell you more about herself, and she will intro the little discussion between her and Barbara. And I think you might know what it's about, because the title tells you everything you need to know, I hope. <laughs> Okay, we're done. <laughs> Take away, coming. Vandy. Can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent. I love amplified voices. Uh, good morning. Welcome to our presentation, Gender, Science, and Skepticism. Um, that was, that was, that's Derek's title, by the way. I would have gone with something more clickbaity or... Like, you won't believe what we found out about gender science and skepticism. <laughs> and what happened next. And what happens next, yes. Anyway, I am Vandy Beth Glenn, as Derek said. Um, this is Barbara Drescher. Uh, she and I will be talking about gender as it intersects with skeptical thought. And I'm going to go first. Act one, <laughs> gender identity and gender dysphoria by me. <laughs> Transgender people have seen their public profile rising in the, la in the past few years. Until just a few years ago, the only place most Americans saw transgender people was on exploitive afternoon talk shows. Transgender people were like circus freaks, ob objects of curiosity to be pitied or made fun of. In fiction, transgender people tended to be portrayed like John Lithgow's character in the movie oh, The World According to Garp. Hypermasculine, despite their best efforts, melancholy, lonely, and wistful. They existed, they existed to be pitied or as comic relief. This fictional type has been called the pathetic transsexual by transgender author Julia Serrano. The winds have changed. That's my best. That's how I... Okay. <laughs> In recent years, that's begun to change, at least in Western society. Competent, successful people who only happen to be transgender have been appearing more often in public roles. Um, Jenna Talakova, for one example, uh, recently competed in the Miss Universe pageant. Amanda Simpson is a presidential appointee who runs the Army Energy Initiatives Task Force. She is the first uh, transgender presidential appointee. Uh, in the lower left there, you see Lana Wachowski, um, uh, one of the Wachowski siblings. Uh, she's a successful film director with her brother. She, uh, she made the Matrix films. And then there on the lower right is Jennifer Finney Boylan. She is a novelist and a college professor and a New York Times columnist. She has written a, a fantastic memoir called um, called She's Not There, which I recommend to all of you. They, and many others like them, are moving transgender people toward a place of greater respect and acceptance. Likewise, several recent federal court decisions and new legislation have affirmed that transgender people are deserving of equal treatment under the law. In 1989, Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins established that employees could not be fired for failing to conform to gender stereotypes. Female employees can't be fired for being too masculine, for example, that, and that, that was at the heart of the case. The, the plaintiff uh, was a woman who was denied promotions because she didn't, uh, she didn't wear enough makeup and she, she wore pants. Um, female employees can't be fired for being too masculine. Male employees can't be fired for being too feminine. In 2010, in an important tax case, uh, Rhiannon O'Donovan finally prevailed in the U.S. tax court um, against the IRS. Uh, she had deducted some of the expenses of her, of her surgical trans transition, and the IRS had disallowed those deductions as being cosmetic. 
uh, at, in the U.S. Tax Court, which is the, the highest, highest court in the country of its kind, uh, it ruled that, that um, treatment for, for gender identity dysphoria is, um, is a legitimate medical expense and is tax deductible. Uh, in 2011, the 11th Circuit Court ruled in Glen v. Brumby that public sector workers in the 11th Circuit, that's Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, cannot be fired for a gender transition. Just last year, um, I'm, I'm sorry, in 2012, Macy v. Holder extended the Glenn ruling via Title VII to apply to all transgender employees, public or private, nationwide. In 2013, uh, state law AB 1266 in California mandated that transgender children must be treated in accordance with their gender of presentation and therefore be allowed to participate in sports and use the appropriate restroom, et cetera, in public schools. Uh, just this year, uh, in fact, just a few weeks ago, President Obama signed what's been called the, the ENDA Executive Order, uh, which mandates that companies that receive federal contracts may not discriminate against uh, any LGBT people, including transgender people, in their hiring practices. As much as anything else, the credit for this current cultural moment for transgender in individuals are enjoying lies with the big Netflix hit Orange is the New, the New Black and its character Sophia. How many of you are fans of Orange is the New Black? Show of hands or applause. Good. It's a great show. As played by transgender actress Laverne Cox, she's a complex, attractive, sympathetic woman like any of the other inmates at Litchfield Federal Penitentiary, and she just happens to be transgender. This portrayal could well be a watershed. Some might even claim we're headed for a tipping point. See what I did there? Uh, after which, transgender Americans, like other minorities before them, are recognized as the normal, ordinary, complicated people they really are. Or, as Jennifer Finney Boylan put it, we are working for the day in which we are as boring as anyone else. <laughs> in the minds of most Americans, the attitude that transgender people are weird or immoral is going away. And all of this is great if you're of a progressive mindset, but what's the angle for the skeptic track here at Dragon Con? Well, I'll start by, by noting that this shift in the civil rights landscape has not gone unnoticed by its opponents. <laughs> Transphobic pundits, mostly in the religious right, have been working hard to rally the fighting in this collapsing front in the culture wars. Dr. Keith Ablo of Fox News has repeatedly said something like this, I was taught to consider Chaz Bono's contention that she is male, as a, the pronoun is his, as a psychotic delusion, a fixed and false belief. Uh, Kevin D. Williamson, who is a National Review columnist and facial stubble enthusiast, uh, said, uh, Cox is not a woman but an effigy of a woman. Sex is a biological reality, and it is not subordinate to subjective impressions. Psychi retired psychiatrist Dr. Paul McHugh said, the transgendered suffer a disorder. Other kinds of disordered assumptions are held by those who suffer from anorexia and bulimia nervosa. I shouldn't have stapled these together. I'm sorry about that. Less intellectualized opinions can be found on comment boards for stories about transgender people. No matter how you change the looks, remove or add parts, you cannot change DNA. You will always be that gender which you were born as. A man who wants to wear women's clothing and call himself a woman's name doesn't deserve any more consideration than to be recognized as mentally ill. A transgender person is a sinner. And he's perverted and going against nature and God as he continues to pursue this course. He is clearly evil. But what does it mean to be transgender? Um, I'm actually transgender myself, and I was the plaintiff in the Glenn v. Brumby case that I mentioned earlier. All the comments on the previous slide are from news stories about me. 
That kind of ignorance is going away and it skews older in all the polls. I like to say that, it, that uh, it's decreasing actuarially in Western culture. But still, most people don't know exactly what transgender means. Simply put, a transgender person has a medical condition known as gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a persistent unease with having the physical characteristics of one's gender accompanied by strong identification with the opposite gender and a desire to live as or to become a member of the opposite gender. I'm transgender, as I said. I'm also a skeptic, and I'll confess that for much of my life this has caused some conflict within me. I try to ground myself in a mechanistic, rationalist worldview, but being transgender means that I believe something about myself that can't be demonstrated empirically. I've come to understand this doesn't make it not real, though. For starters, it's not a delusion. If you tell a delusional person that the strange thing they believe is real, it doesn't make them happier or put them at ease. It just makes them retreat further from the real world. Transgender people, on the other hand, thrive when allowed to transition. Transition can include changing gender presentation, changing legal name, hormone replacement therapy, electrolysis, surgery, or all of these. Also, the elements of gender dysphoria are different from delusions. A delusional person may well believe he is Napoleon, a trans man, however, will understand that he has a biologically female body. He just wants to change it. Gender dysphoria is also not BIID. BIID is Body Integrity Identity Disorder. People with this condition are mentally alienated from one of their appendages and feel a discomfort that they believe can only be relieved by having this appendage amputated. Some think gender dysphoria is similar because transgender people may also have body parts removed as part of their treatment, but this is a superficial similarity. Many transgender people never have any surgeries at all. Treatment of gender dysphoria is in how they live their lives and how they present themselves to the world. It is not necessarily only about their anatomy. It is also not body dysmorphia. Body dysmorphics have a distorted view of how their bodies look. Uh, again, as, as with delusions, uh, transgender people know their body's biological sex, they just don't want it. It is also not intersex. Intersex people have uh, one of hundreds of different conditions characterized by ambiguously shaped genitals, chromosomal anomalies, or other characteristics that make their biological sex atypical or hard to determine. These include androgen insensitivity syndrome, in which a chromosomally XY male's body uh, cannot make full use of testosterone, or in some cases can't make any use of testosterone. So they tend to develop as female. If they, if they have a complete resistance to testosterone, uh, they tend to develop, in fact, as a, as a very hyper, hyper feminine, hypersexualized females, even though they have XY chromosomes. Another intersex condition might be uh, a female born without a vagina or a male born with undescended testicles. Intersex people face, may face similar challenges as transgender people, uh, especially if they're assigned the wrong gender at birth, but they're distinct from transgender people. Transgender individuals usually are genotypically and phenotypically uncomplicated. Now, I'll go back to this comment I mentioned earlier, now that I've brought up chromosomes. Um, no matter how you change the looks, remove or add parts, you cannot change DNA. You will always be that gender which you were born as. It's interesting to me that transphobes are so impressed by the authority of our genomes since we've only known about them for less than 100 years. Imagine if you went back to the 19th century and told a person from that time that they were wrong about their own perceived gender because a tiny molecule inside every cell in their body said otherwise. I don't think you'd get much traction with your argument, especially with people of the same sort of conservative mindset who tend to be transphobic today. What's real is what works. It's difficult to find a single study or survey to track transition outcomes since there's no well-defined endpoint for transition. Not everybody needs surgery. Not everybody can 
take hormones for medical <coughs> reasons. Um, so it transition, and, and also not everybody wants to to do all the all the different procedures that are associated with transgender treatment. Um, so it can mean different things to different individuals, and there aren't many longitudinal studies so far. But there was a 2011 study that found that 94% of transgender people improved their overall quality of life after transition, and 96% had an improved sense of well-being. What doesn't help doesn't matter from the skeptic's point of view. Uh, it's off often said that uh, transgender people should be treated psychologically. Um, talk therapy should convince them that they, they should be happy with the, the gender that they were assigned at birth. Um, this doesn't work. Before the current treatment uh, regimen of hormones and, and surgery and uh, such like that as appropriate to each individual was developed, they tried many other things over decades. Uh, talk therapy was tried and it didn't work. Shock treatment, electroconvulsive therapy did not work. Um, and is also kind of mean. Um, and uh, they tried giving uh, trans women testosterone injections to make, I guess, to make them feel more like men uh, and vice versa. They, uh, they would uh, give uh, trans men uh, treatments of estrogen, uh, presumably to make them more, more happy as females. Uh, that hasn't worked and that didn't work and in fact that the, uh, the changes that the hormones brought just made them more unhappy. Um, transitioning is the only treatment that has ever been shown to be effective um, and for the skeptic that's all that should matter. And there we are. Well that, that went faster than I expected. <laughs> I apologize but um, but now, Barbara will blow you away. Well, I, I, I don't know if I'll blow you away, but I think I can, I can add to what Vandy Beth said and, um, and maybe move to a different area, and, and you can see how these two things kind of intersect. I, I think gender differences are a big issue culturally today, as they probably have been for decades. So I think it's important to cover that as well. And it ties into... Um, what it means to be transgender as well, because I think that there's some reliance on binary classifications. Um, so the question is, what do we know? What does science tell us about gender differences? And I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time going into detail, so I'm going to be kind of quick, because I have a feeling that we'll spend most of our time here answering questions, which I think would be more productive and more interesting. But I do want to um, lay some groundwork because I'm, in answering some of these questions, I may actually refer to some of the, the issues here. Um, one of the things that, that Vandy Beth talked about is chromosomes. And the question of chromosomes, you know, what, what sex were you born with or what does your DNA say, is an interesting one because the problem with, with using that as an argument um, and against being transgender, you know, or transgender being a, a delusion, is what does it, what does it actually mean? what does it mean to have a, an XX or an XY? And what chromosomes do is they, they're a blueprint. They're a blueprint that, of instructions that tell a developing organism you know, what to do or parts of the organism how to develop. And so you have to look at the development and um, things like there's mountains of research on how much testosterone uh, a fetus is exposed to in the womb and so forth. And we can see differences based on chromosomes. We can see differences that are, um, that run a spectrum. Um, what we still don't really see though are how those differences then play out in behavior later in life or even in to a newborn. How quickly those things become differences in behavior and differences in identity. Um, so gender identity can be very separate from chromosomes because there's a very complex system at work here uh, that starts with chromosomes, but it, it doesn't end there any more than when you put somebody into a culture, they are exactly what they were when they entered that culture. So there's a, there's a number of different variables at play here, and what we find is that um, gender is not necessarily a binary thing, but that binary classification system works 
pretty well, reasonably well for most purposes. One of the things I've, I found very interesting when I was kind of brushing up on the topic for this panel was um, that it's a categorization. Gender is a categorization. It's probably the very first categorization we learn as babies. And it makes sense why that is. Because the purpose of gender, anybody? Reproduction. So there's an evolutionary purpose to that, right? It, babies are very good, or children are very, very good at telling a boy from a girl. What they're not very good at is determining what that actually means. What does it mean to be a boy or a girl? Um, I was chatting with Carol Tavris at, at TAM about this, and she told some interesting stories about um, you know, how children argue over what it means to be a boy or a girl. And there, there's an age, there's a, a window at which they're testing all of these things. And um, you know, one child says to another, no, it means you like pizza. If, if, you're, if you're a girl, you like pizza because they, all the women they know like pizza, you know. Um, so it's, it's fascinating. They will try out these different, different things to try to figure out what that means in terms of behavior. Um, and it really has very little bearing on how they're going to feel about it later in life. So I do want to talk about when we're talking about the science, why this is such a complex issue. Um, and that's part of it is because there's a difference between statistical differences and practical differences. And that's, um, that's something that I do want to explain in visually a little bit before we even take any questions. Why don't we try uh, start with the first slide. So when we're looking for what we call statistical significance when we do a study, we're, try we're testing one hypothesis against another. And that's on you know, a particular measure. So th these are probability distributions. So on the, on the x-axis, which is the horizontal line for those of you who don't study this stuff, um, is a score on any given thing. So let's say we're talking about um, scores on the verbal SAT. And on the y-axis is the probability that, you will, that a person will get that score. So the, the hump in the middle is the mean. That's the average. Most people are going to cluster around the average. Most of the things that we study in psychology, most of the things related to human beings are, are distributed in a manner we call normal. This is a normal distri distribution. You've heard of it as the bell curve. Okay, and that is that people tend to cluster around a mean and then there are fewer and fewer examples as you get to the extremes, either below or above. So even something like IQ, there's, you know, if, if the IQ, mean IQ is 100, you're going to have very few people in the 25 to 50 range, and then you're going to have very few people in, say, the, the 180 to, to 200 range. So we have, what we have are two different distributions. Um, we can test a hypothesis against um, what we measure, or in this case, I'm going to talk about the difference between, say, men and women. So if you, if you can imagine the, the red distribution is women and the blue distribution is men, maybe we need a different example then. Maybe we'll say um, math scores or visuospatial ability. You've all heard men are better at maps, right? Okay, let's move to the next one. So when we measure these things and we see, a we see these two distributions and we plot them, if there are large differences, say gender differences, then those distributions are going to be fairly far apart. Okay, um, Statistical significance is our ability to tell these distributions apart from a set of data. So if we look at scores on the x-axis, just dots across the horizontal, can we tell whether that score comes from a subject that is in the distribution in red or the distribution in blue with any amount of reliability. Statistical significance is being able to tell with a, with a preset, you know, reasonable reliability. Um, and then if they're far apart, yeah, there's some reasonable predictability there. It's never going to be perfect. You're never going to be able to know if you pulled, you know, at random a score, whether it's in the red distribution or the blue distribution. But you, you're, you're going to at least be more likely than chance, okay? If those distributions are very close together, it takes large, large, large amounts of subjects 
in order to see those differences at all. And that's what you see when you find out that men are better at math or women are better at verbal ability, things like that. What you're seeing are large sample sizes and that distribution that's on the right is a, could be a st statistically significant difference. It may be, we may be able to detect that difference, but is it practical? I think there's, a, there's another. Yeah. So these, um, let's look at something like um, the average height of American women. The average height of American women is 64 inches. The average height of American men is 70 inches. Those are reasonably far enough apart. You can't tell perfectly just by knowing somebody's height if they're a man or a woman, but you can, you have, a, you have at least a general, like it's better than throwing a dart at a, at a board, right? You can at least predict with some reliability. I'm going to the next one. So you see that overlap is where you're gonna have some serious ambiguity. Um, the place that's shaded red is all women, the place that's shaded blue is all men, and then you've got overlap, okay. But when they're closer, closer together, like visuospatial abilities, math abilities, anytime you pull, from, pull at random from a, from a population, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference. So in other words, if you're trying to hire somebody that you need for a job that needs um, good visuospatial ability skills, do you hire a man or a woman based on statistically significant differences that men are better than women? No, because any people, any samples that you're getting, any applicants that you're going to get, you're not going to be able to tell based on a visuospatial score what, whether they're a man or a woman. So why would you then say, I need a man for something because they on average score higher when those differences are not practically significant? Okay, I think that's the, the last one, yeah. So practical significance is much more important in everyday life. We can find all kinds of gender differences, um, especially in controlled laboratory experiments. A lot of times though, we can also make those gender differences appear when we change the context of something. So we don't know how meaningful these, these differences are. Um, gender differences can be important in things like um, medical, testing and things like that. Um, there are some important gender differences, but for the most part, the differences that people talk about don't really matter. They just don't matter. And that's one of the reasons we need to see beyond gender. And maybe not, we need to study gender differences but not be so hung up on them. Um, I wanted to just kind of end with, um, a few things that Harriet Hall said. She summed it up really well in this, in this piece in Skeptic Magazine. This is a, uh, an issue of Skeptic Magazine from last year. We actually have some copies, don't we, Derek? Mm -hmm. We have some copies? I, I, I think I have two left. Okay. Um, didn't get one, you want one. I have a couple There left. may be more at the table too, right? Possibly. Possibly? Possibly. Okay. So th there's, a, there's an, a couple of excellent articles in here. One of them's um, by Harriet Hall, and, and her summary uh, said some things that uh, very eloquently that I wanted to say. Um, one thing that she said is any toddler can tell a boy from a girl, but science can't. There's no simple, reliable test to determine whether an individual is male or female. We know there are gender differences, but we haven't been able to pin down exactly what they are. <laughs> okay. And so, and this is mostly in terms of things like behavior and um, abilities, um, all sorts of abilities. We have these ideas that men are different, that they communicate differently, that they think differently. Um, and that they have different sets of abilities and different uh, sets of skills than women do. Uh, and whether, even whether those things are, are culturally determined or biologically determined is largely a moot question when they don't necessarily really exist in any practically significant manner. Um, she also has a, a few statements that, that I think are important, things like we can't stop categorizing, but we can keep in mind that gender categories are, um, that, they, they, they don't really matter that much. Um, they're not absolute. And real sef sex differences exist. They're very important in things like medicine, but maybe not so important in things like employment and so forth. Um, and for most practical purposes, the binary classification is sufficient, but that doesn't mean that we have to be rooted in it. Um, we can recognize that there are gray areas in just about everything, and that includes gender. 
um, that's, I think that's pretty much all I really wanted to say. I think I'd rather hear what questions people had unless you wanted to add to that. Um, no, I have nothing to add. Um, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe uh, one of you will help spark some more discussion about this. Um, do they need to go to the mic, Derek? Okay. I, I'm, whoa. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. You're powerful. I, I'm hearing a couple of interesting contradictions with what you're saying. The first is that we need to follow the data, but you've admitted there are no good longitudinal studies, which is, I mean, I've researched the issue somewhat. I can't find data that I consider scientifically meaningful because we're dealing with very small population sizes. What, I, I need you to clarify on what question are you talking about? Well, for instance, what is the long-term satisfaction? Just are you talking about, talking about gender, after transitioning? Gender transitioning. Gender transitioning. Okay. Well, after transitioning. What is the rate, for instance, I mean, anecdotally, you can find a few cases of people who've transitioned and said, whoops, I'm in a mistake. It's like a tattoo I shouldn't have gotten. Is that 0.5%? Is that 50%? Again, we're dealing with some very um, small population sizes. Exactly. And so the numbers don't seem to be good. So, I mean, from a skeptical perspective, the absence of data should seem to indicate a kind of withholding of judgment on, on larger pictures without a better data set. Sure. And again, I don't see a good data set. The other thing that, uh, between the two of you that seemed like an interesting contradiction was the notion that gender issues shouldn't really matter. But if gender doesn't matter, then why would a male wish to become a female or a female become a male I, if it doesn't matter? Let me clarify what I said. Okay. Okay. Um, they, don't, they don't matter necessarily when it comes to context such as the workplace. Right. Um, they certainly matter if you're looking for a spouse right. um, and you have a preference, right. then of course they matter. So there are contexts in which gender does matter. Um, you go down to the bar this evening, it's gonna matter, right? right. But my point is that they don't matter in, when we're talking about things like it, social interactions, um, abilities, Things like that. Right. There's a, there's a myriad of pop psych books out there. You know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, um, in the female brain uh, that talk rules. about <laughs> huh? the rules. The rules, yeah. Um, that talk about how men and women should interact mm -hmm. and how you know men are better at this and women are better at that. And the truth of the matter is, none of that is very practically significant. There are contexts in which gender matters and there are contexts in which it doesn't. And I think that it matters more to the person, to the individual, right. than it does to, should to the outside world. Gender identity does matter to but most if I can, of us. If I, if I can draw an analogy though, for employment purposes, it, it shouldn't, it legally should not matter and, mm -hmm. and functionally shouldn't matter if I'm dealing with a, an Asian or an African American or Caucasian. But if I decide to present as an African American because I feel my true nature is African American and start painting my skin and dyeing my hair and taking on an urban patois, I can imagine an employer getting very uncomfortable in that situation and having me in the workplace and the interactions that I'm gonna be provoking. So there's two different questions. One is whether there is a statistical difference that is meaningful and so broadly meaningful that I can discriminate on that basis, which I think is fairly safe to say there isn't as opposed to the presentation issue, which is one that I think is going to continue to create issues. I think an employer's discomfort shouldn't be um, a factor in judging whether someone is deserving of a position. In, in fact, uh, the judges said almost exactly that when they ruled in my favor in my, in my case. In my case was an employment mm -hmm. uh, case. My, the man who fired me actually said that, that my transition would make my coworkers uncomfortable. Mm -hmm and that the legislators, I worked at the state capitol, that the legislators would think it was immoral. Okay. Um, and the, the, the judges stated unequivocally that those are not good reasons to fire somebody. Um, <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, some very conservative judges said that, in fact. Um, but uh, again, getting back to what is, what is real, um, uh, racial dysmor dysphoria is not, is not real. I mean, it's not it's not a recognized it's not a recognized thing um i did talk about how it is it is hard objectively and empirically to to i mean they they don't make any transgender litmus paper that they could apply to the skin and find out uh, oh yeah okay this person this person is transgender um that doesn't make it not real and there is you know more than a century of of data showing 
showing that it is. Uh, um, there, and again, I said it's, there, it can't be empirically demonstrated, but that is beginning to change. There, I, I didn't mention it in the in the, my in my presentation because it's still kind of preliminary, but but they are starting to find data that suggests that the brain structures of transgender people um, are are more similar to their their preferred gender than their birth gender. I, I think I, I also um, I have to take issue with the 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 concept that it's not empirically demonst uh, demonstrated. I think maybe for the individual can't they can't empirically demonstrate that they are the gender that they identify with, but we can we empirically demonstrate that ten transgender people exist. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. that, that I think there's a there needs to be um, a clarification there that there's a difference between saying that. Uh, the, the, where the empirical uh, data are lacking is with the individual's identification and being able to say, yes, I am. Sure, I'm not, I, 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 I wasn't using the term empirical with any, with any scientific it. rigor. I just meant it's not, you know, it's not demonstrable in the same way that, that a person's height or eye color is demonstrable. Yeah. Hi, um, I was really curious about how one can tell what their gender is in the first place because there's a huge number of stereotypes that not everyone fits into but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're transgender and additionally there's a lot of body shaming especially for women so how can you differentiate between a combination of atypical interests um, for your for your birth gender and um, and body shame versus being an actual transgender person. Well, it's a um, it's a it's a spectrum like most like most human phenomena, um, and it's it's not about it's not about who you do. Excuse me, it's not about what. <laughs> Question too. Paging Dr. Freud. Um, <laughs> it's it's not about what you do. Um, you know there are um, the, the stereotypically um, gay gay men played with Barbies when they were when they were children. It doesn't doesn't mean they were they were transgender uh, women. Um, uh, I. I like I like to think I'm I'm fairly feminine now, but uh, um, I'm still I, I still love power tools. I have to take a drooling towel with me when I go to Home Depot. Um, <laughs> so do I. So there you go. Right. So um, you know, it's behavior. Behavior is is not a marker of of one's gender identity. It's you know it, it's what's it's what's on the inside, it, and it's you know it's just something that I've understood about myself since about puberty, uh, it, it's a realization or, or um, um, an awakening that comes at different times for different people. Um, but uh, um, it, is, you know, it is undeniable to the person who has it that, uh, that they are transgender. Um, and a, a, you know, it, some people might mistakenly think that, and that's, what's, that's what psychi psychologists are for, um, pe people like Barbara. Well, um, no, I'm not a clinical psychologist. So you just I said people know. like Barbara. <laughs> nice people. <laughs> um, I just don't want anybody coming to me for therapy because you don't want that. Trust me. <laughs> and there, are, there have been misdiagnoses, and and um, there have been a few isolated um, horror stories and and tragedies um, resulting from those misdiagnoses. But they are extremely, extremely. Um, low in number. Um, does that answer the question? As best as you can, probably. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip around just a little bit. Uh, okay. To the gentleman that was up here at, uh, first to ask a question, uh, the data that he might be looking for doesn't really exist about transition outcomes because, frankly, nobody really gives enough of a shit to perform those studies. I mean, let's be honest. There's not a big, uh, there's not a big cry to perform. That, that's not true. Yeah, that's I, I not don't true believe that. Uh, those, those, that research is taking place, and more of it all the time. And that's, actually, that's another, that's another way that that changes in culture can improve, can improve um, 
the world in other realms because there is this greater greater interest in transgender people now and I, and I, and I think that will lead to well, more I don't research. argue that it's not occurring now. I'm saying we don't have that ton of data already because of that. Okay. There's, I, there's a, there are a lot of things that need to be studied more than they are, and I, I don't think it has anything to do with people not being interested. I think a lot of it is um, it's resources, and there are only so many people, you know, doing the work. But I think there is there there is data. It's just not sufficient to draw conclusions. And in social sciences, you need a lot of data to draw conclusions about anything. And uh, in in Vandy Bath's opening uh, slideshow, she uh, she stated that transgender was not intersex, and I don't think we know enough to say that it's not necessarily intersex. Because if there's any studies that we do have comparing the state of the brain structure of transsexual women to cisgender women, they're more similar than they are to cisgender men. It's not intersex as, as standard definitions would have it. But we also don't test transgender people to see if they have any of those existing trans uh, intersex characteristics either. I Normally, think that, that's all. That's also not true. Um, oh, please, really? I mean, I, I, none I mean, of the trans It's definitely not is. universal, but I definitely know know many trans people who have who have had um, chromosomal workups done. Yeah, we're also talking. We're but talking about see, a, a relatively just, small know, but you're pointing pool just to, to sample from as well. Intersex covers way more than just chromosomal. That's, that's true. And uh, we're not even getting into epigenetics or anything. But uh, one more statement that the gentleman at the microphone had made is, and, and this, is, this is common in our society, when a man decides to become a woman, and from a transsexual point of view, they already are. They're not becoming anything. They're just assuming the role they always knew they had. Mm -hmm. True. That's true. And that, that's all for my comments. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Make um, sure that your question's a question. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. You got me. Uh, Vandy, in your presentation, when you showed examples of transgender people, it uh, seemed to me like they were all showing examples of males transgendering the females. And it's my perception that that is more often covered that way in the, uh, the press. The females transgendering the males don't seem to get as much coverage. Do you see that type of disparity in coverage or is there a disparity in the actual people doing the transgendering? That's an excellent question. Um, and I don't have a good answer. Uh, you are correct, all of my examples were of trans women. Um, Isn't that more common? Isn't that much more common? I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> When I was putting my presentation together, I, I, I tried to find examples of people that all of you have heard of, um, and um, uh, that all of you are have heard of, and uh, all of whom are um, are re respectable and accomplished people. Um, and um, I didn't think of any. I, I couldn't think of any trans men who fit that profile. Uh, at the time, I didn't I didn't consider the fact that it may be it may be due to a, a gap in coverage. Um, I, I did think of Chaz Bono and of Thomas Beatty. Thomas Beatty, uh, you all may remember, was the so-called pregnant man who was in the news a couple of years ago. Um, I felt that both of their stories were a little s sensationalized and not really not really illustrative of the point that I was trying to make. So I left them out. Um, it's a good question whether 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 trans women get more attention than than trans men. Certainly, historically, that's been true. If you think about um, the few other cases of very famous transgender people in the 20th century, uh, Christine Jorgensen, um, Renee Richards, uh, no one else comes readily to mind. Um, but certainly, that they were both trans women, and and the media loved the media loved. Uh, I think me, the media loves the the contrast of a, a, a very masculine person becoming very feminine. Like uh, Christine Jorgensen, George Jorgensen had been a, um, in the army for a couple of years, uh, or perhaps had been a Marine. And so some of the headlines uh, when Chris, Christine um, hit the news was, um, let's see, XGI becomes bathing beauty. Um, they love the idea of people transitioning to those extremes. And I think 
that is going to be that is going to be more dramatic in the case of trans women because uh, uh, females are generally allowed uh, more leeway in their presentation. Uh, after all, I mean, you see you see women in pants. Obviously, uh, you don't generally see men in skirts unless, unless you're you come here to Dragon. at Dragon Con. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that. What was the thing I was going to get back to? Oh yes, um, uh, historically it. Um, has been thought um, that there were more trans women than trans men um, by a lot, by like two thirds to one third. Um, but uh, again, there isn't good data on that. Um, and at, as the as the phenomenon has progressed and more has been studied, uh, the numbers have become more equal over time. Um, but also, again, it's a spectrum, um, and to fully transition on an individual basis, some people just need to start presenting as their preferred gender. They don't get, they don't have any, um, they don't get any hormone therapy, they may not even legally change their names, um, and, and they, they, they certainly don't always get surgery um, or take, or take hormone therapy. Um, that, so, you know, various places along that spectrum are enough for people. Well, for females in our society, um, I think it's much less it's much less stigmatized for a woman to be a little to be a little butch, for a female to be a little butch than for than for a male to be um, to be you know to be to be feminine. I mean, you know, tomboy tomboy is not is not a, an insult or a slur. Sissy very much is an, an insult or a slur. So, um, I don't obviously I don't have data on this, but I think I think the fact that that there's more leeway in a, fem in a female's gender presentation to begin with could mean that, that um, uh, people assigned female at birth um, feel less of a need to, to um, make a big deal about their transition or to, or to formally transition. Um, but the, that, those are st studies still to be done. And it's a good question. Barbara, did you? No, I think okay. you covered it. Hopefully, that's that's changing, you know, so that more and more it, there's there is less of a an imbalance there. As I said, the numbers are becoming more sexism. equal, but I think most studies do show that there there are currently still more trans women than trans men. And I was out partying last night, so I, I apologize if I can't make my point as clearly as I'd like to. Okay, <laughs> give but, it a uh, shot. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. My question is, do you think that uh, transgender people really benefit from being part of the LGBT community? And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, the normal LGBT narrative is more of a narrative that there's nothing, you know, there's, I want to be different. This is who I am. Everybody needs to accept, you know, me being this way. And uh, I know that seems to be almost exactly the same thing as you would want to say for a transgender person, mm -hmm. but most of the transgender narrative more, I have a medical condition. <clears throat> I need treatment for my medical condition so that I can be like everybody else, you know, right. to go toward boring, in other words. And I, I, it seems to me that it, it is like a conflicting narrative with the normal sort of lesbian, gay, bisexual sort of narrative. And uh, also, have you ever encountered or would you comment on uh, transphobia <coughs> in the LGBT community? Uh, well, transphobia does exist in the LGBT community. It's most distressing when it's in the T part of the LGBT community. Um, uh, and you're right, there has historically been tension between uh, the transgender community and the LGB community. Um, there continues to be such tension, um, um, but it's it's appropriate um, it's appropriate to for it all to be the same movement um, for the very simple reason that um, we're all hated by the same people for the same reasons. <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's about sex in every case, and yes, transgender um, gender dysphoria is more is more uh, medicalized. Than, than homosexuality, um, but it, for the purpose of civil rights, that doesn't really matter. Um, and and also when you again, the 
the laws that will pr that protect transgender people, say in the workplace, um, will also protect butch women, and will also protect um, feminine uh, feminine men. Um, so that has that has a concern for the for the LGB community as well as for the transgender community. Um, so. It, in that regard, I, th I think it's completely appropriate for it all to be considered the same movement, um, which is not to say education of our of LGB people about transgender issues is not important. Um, that certainly I have in, I have known about um, a lot of ignorance and a lot of a lot of transphobia within the gay community, and that is that is something that should be addressed. Thank I think I think where some of the tension might be coming it from is that. They're, they're different things. Sexual orientation and gender identity are, are different things. And sometimes I think that maybe some shallow thinking puts them in the same pot. And I think what Vandy Beth is saying is that for the purposes of the community, especially when it comes to you know things like discrimination, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about sexual orientation or gender identity. But it, then it does when you're talking about individual experiences and things like that. So for the purposes of, of reducing discrimination and finding support, I don't see why they, they shouldn't be um, natural friends. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hey. Um, what you mentioned how with uh, some of the research, how you know, despite it being a small data set, but in time, you know, they could start, you know, using like, you know, the fetal testosterone to detect. Oh, there's a mountain of research on that. Right. But for me, the concern is medical, or, or the, the medical ethics and misuse if they, you know, tell a couple that like, you know, we run the test and like, you know, given, you know, X percentage certainty that this child will be transgender. Here's, here's the thing, that's, never, that's probably never going to happen. Okay. Because and with all of, the, all of the, the hypotheses about what fetal testosterone exposure does, um, a lot of it is, it, it's, it's so complicated and complex. I mean, oh, yeah. you really just, we're not at that point. And we're, I don't think, and I, I don't know that we'll ever be at that point where you can say, okay, well, at, at this point in the pregnancy, there's all this testosterone. Um, therefore, this is going to happen. This is what you're going to end up with <laughs> at birth. I don't, I don't know that we'll ever be there. There are numerous case studies of identical twins uh, even one case of a set of conjoined twins, only one of whom is transgender. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, f it, it's amazing how little fetal testosterone if it, exposure actually tells us about future behavior. It's, it's amazing. Thank, thanks. Good question, though. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, the transgender community is experiences a lot of ignorance and a lot of hatred and really yes and <laughs> I um so thank you for speaking out um where I'm from I hear a lot of ignorant things being said and my question is from the the cis community how do we be allies um what could you resources could you point, point people toward so when we're talking to our more ignorant relatives uh, about things like this, and this is not my experience. So how do how do I how do I help? How do people who want to help do so in a in a logical way? Uh, what would what do you want us to know? What do you want us to take away from this? I guess is my question. Uh, well, there um, there there could be and probably have been um, books written on this subject. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I would just boil them down to to treat transgender people just like everybody else. Treat them like cisgender people, the people that you know. Um, some things I've I've encountered is is um, you know um, especially earlier on in my transition, pe people when people interacted with me socially, um, they might tell me um, they might tell me how attractive I was or you look great, or something like that, in a context where they would, wouldn't have said that to a cisgender woman. So, um, you know, the subtext that you get from that was, hmm, huh, you actually look okay. <laughs> uh, you know, and pe you know, people, people do that with the best of intentions, um, and yet it, has, it, has, it can have the result of, of hurting one's feelings. So, you know, that 
that's that's one example. Um, if if you just extrapolate from that example to treating trans people just like everyone else, um, then you'll you'll be fine. You'll you'll be a good ally, and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pose an interesting hypothetical question from an employer standpoint. Say you hire um, a worker and you, know, you hire them because of the qualities that they embody at the time and then three years down the road they undergo transition surgery and they don't embody those qualities anymore. Now from a legal standpoint, do you have the right to fire them if they become a very mean person after the surgery? Like, if they become a mean person after no, the surgery? I'm, no, I'm saying like, um, what I'm saying is, because uh, you know I, know, I know a transgender man that uh, he switched in, he changed, I guess I should say, into a woman, and after the surgery... So she's a, she's a transgender yes, woman, not yeah. a transgender man. Yeah, my, just, my mistake. Um, just but, the record. Uh, her personality is radically different than when, um, I guess I could say, she was a man before the surgery. So from an employer standpoint... If one of your employees, if their personality radically changes, um, in say in a bad way, do you have the right to fire them or do you let them be because they're expressing who they truly are in your workplace? The, the question is, do you have a, the question really is, do you have a right to fire somebody? Let's say they're in a service position who's doing a poor job. Okay, it, that, it really yeah. does it have anything to do with the surgery? Or is it just a, it just happens to be that it that it there's there was a surgery between the let me reiterate the let me reiterate unless unless you've actually been told this there may not have been any surgery involved a, a, okay. a gender transition is is not about surgery it's not about one's right. anatomy it's That's about it's about how they how they present to the world and interact with the world all right thank you um I, well but I don't think you answered Barbara's question oh um, yes um. Uh, yeah, I guess you would be right then. It, w it would just be that somebody was performing a bad job, you'd have the right Right. It's not it. really about the transition, is it? Um, I guess, yeah. Isn't, right. I, I think I, maybe um, Vandy Beth could expand on this a little bit, but I think it, the question is really what is, what is the reason someone is getting fired and, and is, is yeah. the question of their, their gender, gender identity relevant? Yes. And I can't think of many... Um, situations where it would be. There are certainly some professions, maybe like acting, <laughs> something like that, where a gender identity might matter, but even in acting it wouldn't matter. So, I, But honestly, in most workplaces, it's not relevant, and you can't fire somebody for something that's not relevant. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's a, I mean, you, this could, the, there is a kernel of a good question there. Yeah. Um, not not to be not to bust on you, but um, I'm thinking of I'm thinking for example of Hooters. I believe I believe it's been established that Hooters uh, has the right to to hire uh, women to work in its restaurants uh, um, to hi to hire women in preference over men. Um, and if if a Hooters waitress uh, transitioned. Um, I don't know what, what, how, what that would imply for her job, and I don't know what sort of um, tr pr protections morally as well as legally um, that person should have. Uh, it, it's a good question, um, and I'm not an attorney, so it, it's not one I can really answer. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. So uh, I am a member of the Georgia Bar, and I saw you at the, uh, the, the Human Resources Law session where you were just as fantastic as you are here. So. Um, I just want to that, point that out. That may not be a compliment. No, no, it, it, it definitely <laughs> is. Yeah, you're, it's, it's good. So, on the Hooters case, just for one second, it was based on appearance, not gender. There were certain characteristics of appearance that they could hire or fire upon, but not gender. So, um, you could be a transgender gender person, and that court carry, uh, case would have no bearing on whether or not they could hire or fire you. It's based on the attributes, not on gender. So there, there's no case currently in front of, uh, front of or has been in front of Georgia where there is a gender-based reason for an employer to hire or fire someone. What, well, if, the, what if those attributes are, are gender-related? I mean, I'm thinking in particular in the case of Hooters, there, there's a certain attribute that is certainly considered a plus by, 
whoever does the hiring at, at Hooters restaurants. Well, uh, of course, but you know, I, you could you could have a number of different ways in which you could display those attributes, either surgically or right. with augmentation, that have nothing to do with gender. It, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. You can All have right. women can have breast reduction um, surgery and not be transgender. True. So. Is that the last question? Oh, and we're out oh. of time. There we go. Excellent. Well, we did fill that. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh,